spying is universal. We all want to know what the other person is up to. And the United States is the prime target. We make the difference around the world. We affect other people's lives. 95% of espionage cases of spies go undetected. That's not a classified figure. We catch only 5% of suspected spies. That's terrifying. You don't know the half of it. As a former FBI agent and chairman of the House Intelligence Committee, I had oversight of all 16 of our nation's intelligence agencies. My name is Mike Rogers. I had access to classified information gathered by our operatives, people who risked everything for the United States and our families. You don't know their faces or their names. You don't know the real stories from the people who lived the fear and the pressure until now. Cubans don't get enough credit for being a first-class intelligence service, and they are first-class. They have proven their worth time and time again over the last 20 years, especially against the United States. In our world, in the counterintelligence world, the Cubans are very aggressive and have been very successful for years. Though they might not pose a military threat, when the Cubans come here and gather information, a lot of times they could sell it to other countries. When we were about to invade, Iraq. Cuba was communicating intelligence information because of their proximity to us, to the regime of Saddam Hussein. So that's what makes the Cubans very, very dangerous in our worlds because they're very aggressive and they're very good. The record suggests that the Cubans have been particularly successful in getting American citizens to supply them with information. There are a number of reasons for that, but the one that strikes us the most is ideological reasons. They did not do it for money. Americans who grew up in the United States in the mid to late 60s, these were college students, and a lot of these young men and women saw the Vietnam War going on, they were opposed to that. And at the Bay of Pigs, we showed the evil side of America in trying to overthrow a people's revolution. And a number of them said, what do I do to help people who are being adversely affected by the United States? The Cubans have a long history of successfully penetrating different aspects of the United States government. Ana Montes is probably one of the more well-known cases. Ana Montes did it for ideological reasons. She did not do it for money. Ms. Montes now faces 25 years imprisonment to be followed by five years of supervised release. This plea should send a loud and clear message to anyone committing acts of espionage in this country. For years, the intelligence community had been monitoring transmissions being sent by the Cubans up the east coast of the United States. Most of their broadcasts to their agents are in voice transmissions, numbers that are read out. These transmissions led to the arrest of Ana Montes in 2001. And the intelligence community was quite proud of Ana Montes' arrest. But unfortunately, following her arrest, they were horrified to learn that the transmissions had not ceased. This led the intelligence community to conclude that the Cubans had another high value asset working inside the United States, and therefore a new unsub investigation commenced. What's an unsub? Unknown subject. Unsub means unknown. I definitely can't get into specifics about when the investigation was initiated. But by 2007, intelligence reporting indicated that there were multiple penetrations of the United States government, at least one of which was located inside the State Department. The State Department's primary role is to conduct foreign relations with foreign governments. The reason why foreign intelligence services, including Cuba, are so interested 
in the State Department is that the State Department develops and implements foreign policy. And that's why non-sub inside the State Department is very dangerous. When you have an unsub, you take the information available and establish what we refer to as a matrix, uh, which is a profile of, of what that person or people look like. So we knew that the likely agency within the United States government that was penetrated was the State Department, that it was penetrated by more than one individual working together, that those individuals had lived in the Washington, D.C. area for an extended period of time. They received their transmissions in English. One of those individuals was proficient in Morse code, and one of the agents was known to have a tumor on their shoulder in a certain time period, late 1996. I'm sorry, that's classified. You want to protect your own sources and methods. I wish it was concrete information such as blue eyes, brown hair, walks with a limp. No, these were more subtle things. These were things like the person spoke English. Thanks, right? Really narrows down our list. I assumed responsibility as the lead FBI case agent for the unknown subject investigation. And we engaged diplomatic security in an effort to try to get their assistance to identify this individual. The Bureau of Diplomatic Security is the law enforcement arm of the State Department. One of our main functions is we run security at all embassies. The foreign minister of a certain country comes in, we'd be responsible for that. I work more hand in hand with the FBI. That's my sole purpose is to help them with State Department cases or information that they need from the State Department. Robert Booth was a diplomatic security counterintelligence agent previously, and he had the historical subject matter expertise that we needed. On May 3rd, 2007, I was approached in my office by the FBI liaison officer who explained to me that they had an unsub espionage case and they thought that I would be able to help them resolve that question. So Robert and I um, went over to FBI headquarters and they presented to us information from the intelligence community believing that the State Department had been penetrated with a possible spy. And this information specifically was coded messages being sent by shortwave frequency from Cuba to the United States. When I asked the FBI how long the transmissions had been going, they said at least nine years. In the State Department, if you're a Foreign Service officer, you have to travel every couple of years. That means he is a civil service employee. Do you know how many subjects we have just eliminated? And they all looked at me in amazement. Now we knew what we had was a civil service employee who worked between 1990 and 1999, all of a sudden, unsub started to appear. The Cubans had another high value asset working inside the United States and therefore a new unsub investigation commenced. I think it might even be, in this instance, more complicated than identifying a needle in a haystack. So I told the FBI at the end of that May meeting that if this matrix is correct, we will find and identify the unsub. That was a bold statement. Robert had one of our other agents in our office do a computer program that basically took the points that we had from the FBI, boiled that down, and we came up with about 27 subjects. I now knew I had my work cut out for me. You feel nervous? Absolutely. I go down and see my colleague in the personal security review section, pass the list of 27 names, and said, Barbara, can you get me the security files on all 27 of these people, you get the files in your name, and then I go to another office with no window. I didn't want anybody to see what I was doing. How many pages is one 
one person's file. Hundreds, hundreds of pieces of paper. It's mind numbing. That you had to read page after page after page. And this is the reality of counterintelligence work. I've never jumped out of a plane. I've never driven an Aston Martin. I've never fired with my left hand, driving with my right hand. That's not counterintelligence, that's James Bond. Real counterintelligence agents sit in front of a screen, read files, and interview people. And your eyes start to strain, you get discouraged. And then I opened up file 13. My heart was racing. There's no other way to describe it. Every piece of the Matrix fit like a glove. It was Kendall Myers. Kendall best fit everything that we were looking at. And then for Robert and I, it was kind of like a minute of, oh, if it was that good feeling that we think we found the person based on the information, now we have to prove it. And that's the hard part. After reviewing the file on my own, I think the thing that put me over the edge was not only were there matches from matrix points that we expected, but this file revealed that he took a trip to Cuba in 1978. Kendall and two other State Department employees traveled down there, and that's when we believed that Cubans first spotted an assistant for possible recruitment. We moved from the unsub phase of the investigation to a directed, targeted investigation on Kendall Myers. At that point, we try to learn as much about his life as possible, everything from the time he joined the State Department until the very present day. Kendall came from a very affluent background. He was very well-educated. He was a very intelligent guy. Kendall Myers came from a little bit of American royalty. His family was quite accomplished. They had a lot of old money. Kendall Myers is the great-great-grandson of Alexander Graham Bell. He is an American blue blood. Kendall Myers was a State Department employee for over 30 years. He was respected within the State Department. He was a very smart man. As far as everybody was concerned, he was a model employee. I mean, he did his job magnificently. I mean, he was a well-respected analyst in the Office of Intelligence and Research. So Kendall was an analyst for the State Department, but this wasn't a case of the State Department being penetrated. This was a case of the intelligence community being penetrated. Kendall Myers worked in the intelligence community portion of the State Department. So he had access to intelligence reporting for all intelligence agencies. Unfortunately, the Office of Intelligence Research, known as INR, gets all the information from the entire intelligence community. CIA, DIA, NSA, imagery, everything. That is why he could have been the most damaging Cuban spy Castro had. So after we established that Kendall was likely one of the agents that we were looking for through doing background investigation on his wife, Gwen, we found out she was likely involved as well. We found that Gwen was an activist in South Dakota before she came to DC. She had that activist bone in her body. We found out that Gwendolyn worked for Senator Abrazak in the 1970s. And Senator Abrazak at that time was known to have very strong pro-Cuban feelings. He'd been trying to work this embargo against Cuba is wrong and everything else. And maybe in that senator's office, she started to get the same kind of inclinations and leanings or feelings about the Castro government. Having a husband and wife team is unusual, but it made sense that she was likely involved as well. You don't need access to classified information. You just need access to someone that has access to classified information. The first thing we needed to do was focus the investigation on Kendall because he had access to the State Department. So I knew that we needed to move the investigation to you know, physical surveillance, electronic surveillance, try to collect evidence that we could prosecute him with. Everybody working this case wanted one charge, and that was 794, big espionage as we call it. When you have an individual with access to that type of information, he can do severe damage to the United States government. 
and potentially cost someone their lives. The first thing we needed to do was focus the investigation on Kendall because he had access to the State Department. We had to be able to show that Kendall Myers was, in fact, passing classified information to a person not authorized to receive. So we needed to move the investigation to, you know, physical surveillance, electronic surveillance. Some of the things that we do in these types of cases are monitor telephone calls, monitor email traffic, install microphones into vehicles and residences. So in this case, I was a co-case agent. My role was collaborating with the FBI and, and just gathering information as much as possible about Kendall Myers. I was the one who had easiest access to the State Department, so if it required me to go over and, and conduct surveillance of Kendall inside the State Department, I would do that. You have to follow him. You have to monitor him. You have to see where he goes. You have to see who he talks to on the phone. You have to see what he pulls up on his computer. You have to look at anything and everything that are suggestive of espionage activity. We were hoping to catch him in the act where he was removing information from the State Department and providing it to the Cubans. And that's what we had to try to do. And he did not do it. So he was not removing classified documents from his office and INR and walking out of the building. We were all convinced it's him, but no counterintelligence, no espionage indicators. So Kendall's had no activity, he's had no contact. It appeared that they were no longer operational. They weren't continuing to provide the Cubans with intelligence. That obviously presented us with the problem of not being able to catch them in the act. If they're not still active, it, it doesn't matter. What matters is that at one time or another, they were working on behalf of a foreign intelligence service, chose to betray their country, and that we're gonna identify them and prosecute them if we can, uh, regardless of how long they've been dormant. So at that point, we were only going to be able to show historical espionage activity, not ongoing espionage. I had just transferred from our computer forensics branch to our counter espionage branch. FBI came and asked us for help, and we had some areas of expertise that were useful. NSA's role, specifically Ethan Andreas, who was the lead NSA counterintelligence agent assigned to the investigation, was uh, in part to conduct a forensic review of Kendall Myers' computer activity at the State Department. Forensics are just pieces of computer information that help tell a story, whether or not you look at a web page, click on an email, or print something. Those are all pieces of forensic information. And so you put those all together and you can get a pretty compelling picture of what somebody's doing day to day behind a computer. The great thing about audit and forensics is, yes, we might have identified Myers in 2007, but the audit and forensic data goes back far more than that. So that we could get a better picture of Kendall and what his actions were before he became a, the subject of investigation. Looking at the work computer and Kendall's past history, we found that he was going what we call off topic with alarming regularity. Forty percent of his searches were dedicated to searching for information the Cubans would have found interesting. That's when I really, really thought that we had the right guy but we needed more to be certain and then prove that case in a court of law. We wanted to show positively that he was accessing national defense information via his access there at the State Department and providing it to the Cubans. That was essential to charging espionage. And the information that we had suggested that Kendall was working for Cuba 
but we still did not have him providing national defense information to a foreign power. We were starting to get a little frustrated because while we were happy that we had the unsub or Kendall Myers, again, we were not seeing any espionage indicators. What made everything worse was the fact that Kendall Myers submitted an early retirement. When Kendall retired, it was a blow to the investigation because you lose home field advantage, right? You lose the ability to control at least an aspect of their life. Even though he had left the State Department, even though he was no longer in direct access to U.S. government information, he still had a lot in his head. And if he were going to choose to work with the Cubans again in the future, that could still be very damaging. So we had to basically regroup and then come up with a new strategy. Kendall's retirement was detrimental to our case from the standpoint that we wanted to show positively that he was accessing national defense information and providing it to the Cubans. That was, that was essential to charging espionage. Now he was enjoying his retired life on his beautiful 34-foot Malmo sailboat that he had bought in Sweden, had brought to the United States. From my perspective, Kendall was a bit of a hypocrite. He supported the Cuban Revolution and the socialist movement from the deck of a 37-foot, multi-hundred-thousand-dollar Swedish yacht. I could never quite wrap my mind around that. The contrast, right, between the justification for helping the Cuban people and the sheer luxury that they lived in, it's hard to ignore. We suspect that due to the fact that most sailboats have uh, an advanced radio system that he very well could have been using it as an operations platform, but we never, we never found any evidence of that. So what do we have? We have our suspect, but no counterintelligence indicators. So what do you do? You keep monitoring him. You find a little nugget here and there. You go into his apartment while he and his wife are gone somewhere. And you look for things. The next logical step was to conduct a physical search of the Myers residence. There's a lot that goes into conducting a thorough, methodical search. When you don't want people to know that you've done that, I think for me, the stress level was very high, uh, very high. So in the course of the search, we found a number of items related to Cuba. A Cuba sailing guide, some nautical charts, related to Cuba. We found a book that was titled On Becoming Cuban. And to those in the intelligence community, we would call that a clue. In and of themselves, none of these things were evidence that Kendall and Glenn were spies, but additionally, we found a shortwave radio. They actually still had the means to receive shortwave radio broadcasts. We found a diary that recounted his 1978 trip to Cuba and conveyed a, a very positive image of Cuba, a very negative image of the United States. It was a glowing report about the Cuban Revolution, how the people were doing well. Castro was a great leader. It essentially conveyed Kendall's infatuation with Cuba. Kendall's diary was critical. But the next piece of evidence was stunning. In a filing cabinet in their closet, there was a record that indicated that Gwen had a tumor on her shoulder in late 1996. That was a matrix point that we were looking for. We knew that one of the Cuban agents had a tumor on their shoulder. Nice. 
I had chills uh, up my spine when I saw this medical record. I couldn't believe it. And this is where I think all doubt in my mind was removed. That just was beyond coincidence. We could have charged them with being foreign agents. We could have charged them at that point with false statements. But none of those charges in our mind held them accountable for what they did and, quite frankly, didn't come with the penalty that we thought that they deserved. Shortly after the FBI search through continued surveillance, we found out that Kendall was signing up for a course on how to do over-the-horizon sailing. So there was a legitimate fear on the part of the investigative group that that might be one of their modes of escape, is to calmly go out to the boat and sail home. And home to them was Cuba. The capabilities of his yacht, you could go over the horizon, and it really wouldn't take much of an effort to get to Cuba. It's 90 miles off the, the Florida coast. And then, you know, with the nautical charts and the Cuba sailing guide. There was a conclusion reached that he was a flight risk and would be leaving the United States for Cuba in the very near future. There was a sense of urgency. We had to do something in order to get him before they'd escape to Cuba. There was a conclusion reached that Kendall and Gwen were at a flight risk and would be leaving the United States for Cuba in the very near future. After the search of the residents, we could have charged them with being foreign agents. We could have charged them at that point with false statements, but we didn't want to charge them with lesser offenses than espionage. So despite all of what we collected, we were still looking for more. We wanted confirmation that Kendall and Gwen had passed national defense information to the Cubans during their espionage careers. And to do that, we were going to need to conduct an undercover operation and attempt to reactivate them as Cuban agents. There were several things we considered. Almost all were rejected until ultimately we came up with a final, almost desperate solution, a false flag. The false flag is a charade. The U.S. government is posing as the Cubans, in this case, the Foreign Intelligence Service. The idea for the false flag was to get Kendall Myers to accept this individual as an authentic Cuban intelligence officer and provide him with information that would incriminate him. It is arguably the riskiest counter-espionage move you can take. If it doesn't work, you know he'll never take a bite at any other suspicious apple. There's a lot of planning and coordination that goes into it. There's a lot of strategy on how to gain that person's trust. You know, how do we want to do this? What are we going to use as our backdrop? What's our story for re-engaging them? So at this time, Kendall was still teaching at Johns Hopkins. And so it was agreed that we would approach him before his class with the undercover, and they would use what we call parole to see if Kendall would take the bait. What's a parole? Parole would be like, didn't I meet you in Paris? No, I think it was in London or something like that. It's like a code word to say, hey, I know who you are. This is who I am. Our plan was to have the individual posing as the Cuban intelligence officer approach Kendall to get his opinion on the incoming administration uh, at that point in time that might affect policy towards Cuba. So we put the undercover in a position where he could approach Kendall as he went into the building. And the undercover greeted him, indicated that he had been sent there by an individual that Kendall was familiar with and that was associated with Cuban intelligence. He handed him a Cuban cigar and wished him a happy birthday because it was his birthday. The undercover was very believable. Part of the bona fides that we were establishing with him was the fact that he had a thick accent. and. At one point during the approach, it actually seemed like it was gonna backfire because the individual was trying to communicate with Kendall and Kendall couldn't understand a word he was saying. 
He repeatedly said that he wanted to meet at the Double Tree, and Kendall thought he was saying W3. He said, let's meet at the Double Tree, let's meet at the Double Tree. It's right down the street. And Kendall said, W3? W3? Uh, he presented. I was listening. I couldn't bear to watch at this point. I just was so afraid that it was going to go wrong. But then the undercover pulled out a piece of paper and a pen and wrote it down for him. And it became very apparent to Kendall who this was and that he was there on behalf of Cuban intelligence to reestablish contact with Kendall in an effort to gain access to information and agreed to meet later that afternoon. You bought it. Hook, line, and sinker. Absolutely. After that initial exchange happened, Kendall went in, and the first thing he did was call Gwen. And we heard the call, and it was very apparent that Kendall was happy. I think he believed they just couldn't wait. They had to have Kendall's opinion, and that was a good thing. He was so excited. And he said, you're not going to believe it. And he said, what's the, what's the guys? You've got to come down. You've got to come down. We really didn't have a lot on Gwen. Kendall was the one with access to information. And the fact that Kendall decided to bring Gwen along was something that we could only dream of. So the undercover, who they believed was a Cuban intelligence officer, and Kendall and Gwen all met for a drink in the bar of the Doubletree. The false flag was excellent. He started off with a little small talk, asked him how they were doing in retirement. Then slowly started talking about, well, you know, you did work for us in the past. It's kind of small, but like Kendall saying, oh yeah, I did. That is a, a minimum acknowledgement, but it's a tremendous acknowledgement. The meeting was good, they took it well. The only person that ever mentioned anything about something not being right, Gwen did say at one point, hey, do you think this is all right? And Kendall said, absolutely, this is good. It was my birthday, Cuban cigar. I think she was uncomfortable. I think she had her doubts. Gwen may have had some reservations, but Kendall convinced her that everything was OK. After the initial meeting in the hotel bar, there were three more meetings that we had with Kendall, with our undercover. During the discussions, they were confirming operational details, right? So Kendall told the undercover that his code name was 202 and that Gwen's was 123. 202 is a pretty bad one to pick. It's the area code for DC. He started explaining how, and laughingly so, how they used to pass information and shopping carts at the giant food store. He also talked about how he would take cables out of the State Department, they would copy them, and then he'd bring them back. His wife, Gwendolyn, also made admissions about working with Kendall to obtain classified information and send it to the Cubans. Gwen was more integrally involved in operations. She was involved in dead drops, passes, processing information that Kendall had removed from the State Department. She is a 100% co-conspirator. So we now started to build up a file on who he met with, times and dates, spycraft, and who he passed the information to. We learned the full story of Kendall's recruitment. He told our undercover that the same Cuban intelligence officer that invited Kendall to travel to Cuba in 1978, then traveled to South Dakota, where Kendall was living in 1979. And what the Cuban intelligence service officer did was walk right up to Kendall and Gwen's door, knock on the door, and introduce himself. That's how bold and confident the Cubans were that they could recruit Kendall Myers. The interesting thing about Kendall was that he basically would do it as long as Gwen was along for the ride. They'd both be in this together, which I found fascinating. So the day he was recruited, she was recruited one minute later. So while we knew that Kendall and Gwen had been active for an extended period of time, we didn't know until then that it had actually been uh, for two and a half decades. In each meeting, we were able to gather historical information, 
you know, places they traveled, places they met the Cubans. But in the three meetings that we had with them, we didn't we didn't get our national defense information. So the objective uh, of the fourth meeting was to push to get them to provide us specific instances of providing national defense information. It was really important for us to prepare the undercover as best we could to go in there and, and kind of press them. You know what you have done here. I know what I can take. Oh, yeah, blame me. Oh, you know. I know. I know. It's not that you are not here. I was extremely nervous that it wasn't going to work. It was nerve wracking. At that point, we did not have another trick up our sleeve. really important for us to prepare the undercover as best we could to go in there and, and kind of press them. You know what you have done here, you are very important, you get a lot of information, documents, whatever, you know? Our undercover did a great job of pushing him for a specific example of something uh, sensitive that he had passed to the Cubans, and Kendall provided a few examples, which did meet the threshold that we were looking for with respect to being examples of very sensitive and, and classified signals intelligence. What was it? Absolutely never going to tell you. I only want to, to, to mention today, again, I was with them, and you know, Kendall became uncomfortable with it. Yeah, I'm not comfortable talking about upper But it was a little too late by then. When he provided us that national defense information, we knew we had enough information to arrest him. We entered the room, and, and an arrest was made. Gwen made a great exclamation, which was essentially, she knew it all along. You know, you think about these people as Cuban spies, but in the end, they were a couple. And that was a nice little view with the wife telling the husband, I told you so. We took both of them into custody and interviewed them separately to try to convince them there on the spot that they should cooperate. And they refused to talk to us. I was at the Washington field office and they brought him back for mug shots and, and fingerprints and our attorneys started in discussions with their legal counsel. And it became apparent that they might be interested in a plea. A retired State Department employee and his wife have been charged with spying for Cuba. Kendall Myers, an intelligence analyst with top secret security clearance, was allegedly Cuban agent 202 for nearly 30 years. His wife Gwen, who worked at a local bank, was agent 123. After his arrest, Kendall Myers agreed to plead guilty, but under one condition, that there's leniency for his wife. So Kendall Myers in the plea negotiations got life in prison, and Gwen Myers got 81 months, which was the longest sentence for a co-conspirator in an espionage case. If he didn't plead, they both could get life in jail. And that way, he, she only got about six or seven years, and he took the life in jail. So I think he very much did love her because he didn't want to see her spend the rest of her life in jail. That's the reason why he pled guilty. Part of the sentencing was that they agreed to be debriefed and be fully cooperative. I think we ended up having 70-something debriefing sessions with them, and it became apparent to me that he was a narcissist, he was a hypocrite, and obviously he was a traitor. The FBI got first crack at him. I had second crack at him. And my job was to find out from Kendall where the weaknesses were in the State Department, why he'd been so successful in what he did. And Kendall, I think, was extraordinarily candid with me. It's not something I planned. It's not a plot. Uh, uh, but it turned out that my best friends were my best sources, and vice versa. And, um, and that, in a way, was uh, the central paradox of my career as a as a Cuban agent. For all the nobility that Kendall wraps his espionage in, 
the guy essentially screwed over, you know, the people that were closest to him regularly. I mean, he manipulated people on a regular basis to get very sensitive information and pass it to an adversary. These people trusted him. They were his friends. They were his peers at work. And he didn't care. When we debriefed him, he told us that, you know, he believed that what he was doing was helping the revolution, helping the, the, the Cuban people. If they loved the people so much, they should have just sailed there and helped them. But they didn't. They didn't want to leave their penthouse and their $650,000 yacht. They wanted to have all of that. During the debriefing, we learned that in 1995, they actually met Fidel Castro. That was something we were not aware of, obviously, and was a, a significant indicator of how valuable Kendall and Gwen were to the Cubans. He was Castro's most valuable spy in the US government, bar none. He compromised hundreds of millions of dollars of operations. He identified specifically the names of both covert and overt US government intelligence officers. There was no diplomatic initiative that Castro didn't know ahead of time what America's hand was. Castro checkmated every single one of our moves. How do you think he survived 11 presidents? He was the personal spy for Fidel Castro.